Great. So just a really warm welcome to everyone. This is our third event for this year's Sociology Colloquium series. And I just want to point out that this is sponsored by the Social Science Student Donation Fund. So for those of you who don't yet know me, my name is Katie Mendez, and I'm going to be chairing the event today. And like always, I want to begin by welcoming everyone to Western University. And I want to acknowledge that Western is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapunak, and Atawandran people. Okay, so uh, now on to the fun bit. So I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Sylvia Fuller. She's a professor of sociology in the Department of Sociology at the University of British Columbia. And it's a real honor to have Dr. Fuller with us today. And uh, her research ex expertise is in the areas of work and labor, gender, inequality, and social policy. So um, if you look at Dr. Fuller's profile, you can see that she's a really prolific author and she's already published three articles this year in journals like Social Forces, Gender and Society, and the Canadian Review of Sociology. But across her career, she's published in the American Sociological Review, Work, Employment and Society, and the Journal of Marriage and Family. Her research covers topics such as parenthood, gender, and the risk of job loss, and this is particularly relevant during the COVID-19 pandemic. And in fact, one of Dr. Fuller's recent articles uses data from Statistics Canada's monthly labour force survey to explore gender differences in employment across the pandemic, and it's a really interesting and impressive piece of work. So based on all this timely and important work that she does, it's really no surprise that Dr. Fuller has also been awarded with many academic honors and prizes. This includes Shirk's Aurora Prize, the Best Article Prize by the Canadian Sociological Association, and she was shortlisted for the Rosa Beth, Rosa Beth Moss Cantor Award for Excellence in Work Family Research. So please can you all join me in welcoming Dr. Fuller, whose talk today is titled Women Managers and the Gender Wage Gap, and Dr. Fuller will have up to 40 minutes to speak, and then uh, this will be followed by a Q&A. So I really look forward to hearing what Dr. Fuller is going to say. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to her. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, having me here virtually. It's really a pleasure to be able to join you. And I will say from the outset that the work that I'm going to be presenting today um, is a collaboration with Young Mi Kim of Yonsei University in South Korea. Uh, and it is a work in progress, so I very much welcome your questions and comments and feedback. So I'd like to start with my own land acknowledgement here um, to say that today I'm fortunate to live on the unceded ancestral and occupied traditional lands of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish nations. And I'm grateful to their efforts since time immemorial to care for and protect these lands that sustain us all. They have done so in the face of ongoing dispossession, imposition of illegitimate settler legal orders and colonial violence. And as we face the dramatic repercussions of the climate crisis here in BC, it's especially important to stand with Indigenous nations in their efforts to continue to care for this land and water, to assert their rightful jurisdiction, and to rebuild and revitalize their nations. Okay, oh, I'm going fast here. <laughs> so gender inequality in work organizations is stubbornly persistent, and the question of how to increase women's representation in positions of power has motivated a really large body of research. Whether breaking the glass ceiling also benefits women lower in the hierarchy, however, is less clear. Optimistically, such women might be motivated and empowered to act as agents of change, improving gender equity among their subordinates. More pessimistic views, however, posit that women managers typically lack incentives and or the power to do so. So today I'm going to share with you some work in progress that takes up this question, arguing ultimately that women leaders' probability of promoting gender equity among their subordinates depends on the relational context in which they work. And we focus here in particular on the gender composition of work groups. So drawing on detailed administrative data from a large Korean conglomerate, I'm going to demonstrate that the demographic composition of work groups women leaders supervise conditions their likelihood of acting as agents of change or cogs in the machine. So to start by previewing some of the general arguments uh, about why women leaders might be promoting gender equity or less likely to do so, those who posit that women managers will be agents of change promoting gender equity often draw on social identity theory, which posits that people tend to hold a more positive view of and feel more obliged to those they see as members of their own social group. Now, gender, of course, is not the only means of identification, 
but it is broadly socially salient and often serves as an implicit, if not explicit, basis on which people are categorized into in and out groups. Now, in male-dominated organizations, homophily reproduces masculine advantage, as men have greater control over organizational resources, favoring men's subordinates through processes of social closure that create greater access to useful networks, to mentoring, and to other opportunities that can positively impact pay. Elevating women into positions of leadership puts them in a position where homophily operates in favor of women rather than men. And research has also found that women tend to be more supportive of equity initiatives, with a greater share of women in power increasing the likelihood that organizations will implement gender equity enhancing policies and initiatives. Now, this is most relevant, obviously, in terms of women in senior positions in the organization who have the power to influence policy and uh, in organizations. But at the same time, the success of such initiatives also depends very much on how they are implemented on the ground, with lower level women leaders potentially more supportive as well at this level. Now, of course, gender is not simply just a basis for identification, but it also tends to operate as a diffuse status characteristic, with men typically expected to be more capable than women, all else equal, unless a task is specifically sex typed as female. We know this from social psychological research. Now, status beliefs uh, shape people's expectations of themselves and of others in ways that can have self-fulfilling effects, influencing what's noticed and remembered and contributing to attribution errors. So in this way, they can impact both performance itself by shaping access to opportunities and also biased perceptions of performance. Now, status characteristics have particular legitimating force when they map closely to extant power relations in a local context. So given this, women leaders may also benefit their subordinates by weakening this link and serving as role models, countering negative stereotypes that harm women and creating a more favorable context for women's performance and its evaluation. And women leaders may also be less prone to endorsing status beliefs that disadvantage women. Consistent with this, studies have shown that women's performance is evaluated less favorably by male versus female supervisors. Now, looking at the other side, uh, of course, women leaders, we should remember, are not immune to broader cultural biases that favor men. And those that do succeed may see their own success as evidence of exceptionalism or evidence of meritocracy, dampening motivations to advance gender equity. And women leaders also face a lot of pressures to disassociate themselves from women in favor of those in power. Social identity and status characteristics theory posit, after all, that the propensity of individuals to favor in group members is conditional on their own status, with lower status groups less likely to do so to avoid devaluation by association. And women managers can also face heightened scrutiny over perceived favoritism if they act to advance the interests of demographically similar others, since those widely shared status beliefs mean favoring women is more likely to raise questions as being illegitimate in some way. All right, so those are the basic ideas about why women managers might have these different effects in organizations. What is the evidence? Well, one strand of research, and this is, has been the dominant strand of research until lately, uh, approaches this question by essentially comparing outcomes for women in organizations that have more or less women in management. So they look cross-sectionally across a variety of organizations and see, well, which ones have more women managers in them and what are the outcomes for uh, women overall in those organizations? And this research has typically found a positive association between having a higher share of women managers and more gender equitable outcomes. But the challenge with this kind of research design is that it's vulnerable to an ecological fallacy. So organizations that promote more women into management are also likely to have more gender egalitarian climates or structures generally. So identifying the direction of the causal arrow is a little bit challenging with this. Now, another set of studies um, uses data on supervisor supervisee diet, so the actual individuals uh, who's the supervisor and the supervisee uh, within organizations, often using administrative data of some sort. And this kind of data is useful for countering the ecological fallacy and also makes sense insofar as managers are most likely to have an impact on the employees who are reporting to them directly. And this research has tended to find null effects overall, um, but it has also identified some contextual effects. So where we see effects in some circumstances, but not others. Uh, so Srivastava et al, for example, found that 
high performing women managers and she had sort of access to performance uh, evaluations for this uh, uh, for this um, analysis um, tended to punish low performing women subordinates more harshly than they did low performing men and she saw this as being sort of evidence of this threat uh, threat scenario here where they were didn't want to be associated with low performing women um, Abraham, uh, looking uh, uh, at uh, pay systems, found that women managers in a U.S. financial services firm reduced gender pay inequity only in less formalized pay components, where there's sort of more opportunity to, uh, to have favoritism one way or the other. And finally, uh, the position in the organizational hierarchy has seemed to matter, with Abraham also finding effects only for women at the bottom of the firm's hierarchy. And Abendoff et al. also found this uh, in German data where they were finding that having more women in management, so that, that other kind of uh, research design only reduced the gender earnings gap for jobs with low qualifications in Germany, and that there was also, again, consistent with Abraham's work, a stronger effect where systems were less formalized. So these findings of variable effects within organizations suggest that maybe rather than seeing women managers as acting in a coherent way, uh, it's useful to consider how particular contexts might differentially trigger the dynamics associated with the amelioration or perpetuation of gender inequality. And this orientation is in line with recent research in what Tomaskovic, Devi, and Evan Holt term relational inequality theory. And the stress here has really been to move beyond a focus on average outcomes in the labor market as a whole, attending instead to how the interplay of institutional environments and organizational features create particular inequality regimes and organizations. And where Avon Holt and Tomaskovic Davy tend to focus uh, for their research design on inter-organizational dynamics, so comparing across organizations, uh, we draw attention instead to variation within organizations. Now, within organizations, work groups or teams matter a great deal for the everyday reproduction or transformation of relations of inequality. First, uh, they're a key site where tasks are assigned and training is provided. And second, teams are often the site where the actual evaluation of individuals takes place. They can also be sites where workers make claims to resources or positions and where these claims are resolved, key processes in the creation of organizational inequality. And there's quite a large literature tying the relational demography of work groups to organizational outcomes, though the focus here has typically been on uh, how those work groups perform. <laughs> So we argue that the gender composition of work groups is also likely to impact mechanisms through which women managers might increase or decrease inequality among their subordinates. So first, we argue that gender salience as a basis for in-group, out-group identification is likely stronger in more gender imbalanced groups, leading us to expect based on social identity theory that women managers will promote gender equity more strongly when groups are more gender imbalanced, whether those are more male dominated or more female dominated, because gender will be more salient there. Now, bias associated with uh, gender as a status characteristic, on the other hand, should only be exacerbated in more male dominated groups where assumptions of greater male competence uh, in work group tasks will be stronger. So having women in leadership roles could thus reduce those sort of token pressures that harm women subordinates in male dominated groups. And the perception of gender inequities may also be more pronounced in male dominated contexts. And indeed, we know that women tend to report higher levels of discrimination and harassment in male dominated occupations. So this could also increase the salience of gender equity as something that needs to be explicitly promoted in these contexts, strengthening motivations for women managers to champion their women subordinates and empowering the latter to make stronger claims for career advancing opportunities. So this leads us to the next hypothesis that that positive female manager effect on uh, gender equity will increase as groups become more male dominated. On the other hand, <laughs> women leaders power and authority might be more tenuous in male dominated groups where presumptions of masculine superiority are likely to be pronounced and where male subordinates majority status may increase their ability to make life difficult for women leaders and this could heighten women managers fear of being perceived as unfairly favoring women so in this case we would expect the a positive female manager effect on gender equity would decrease as groups become more male dominated 
All right. So how do we how do we test these hypotheses? So we uh, we are basically uh, looking at a case study uh, of a large Korean uh, food conglomerate. We call it uh, Food Co. Though I don't actually have to hide the identity of it. Uh, I can tell you what it is afterwards because uh, we didn't promise uh, confidentiality. Um, food Co. is uh, this really big company. It has 23 subsidiary companies operating under six business units. It has uh, it sells its products uh, in Korea and in North America as well under a variety of different brands. Uh, they, they sort of have a reputation of manufacturing healthy food and they also have sort of catering, industrial catering businesses. So they, they're, they're a very large conglomerate. Um, they had approximately uh, 6,000 Korean employees and annual sales of around $2 billion. Now, Food Co. is a useful case to test our propositions because it has a substantial share of both women and men workers, uh, women are about 40% of the workforce, um, and supervisors, and more women who are an, in these supervisory roles than in most Korean companies. It actually has a reputation being a little bit more family friendly than, uh, than generally is the case. Uh, and it has a lot of work groups, which vary substantially in their gender composition. So to put Food Co. in context, um, it's useful to know, first of all, that Korea has among the highest levels of gender inequality in the labor market in the advanced industrialized countries. It has the highest gender wage gap among OECD countries. It's here at the top. And the share of women in management is also very low, now at bottom, <laughs> by OECD standards, with only Japan ranking lower on this measure. Now, uh, Korea also has the lowest share of women board members across its largest 500 corporations in the OECD with only 2.3% of uh, women serving on those boards. So the Korean state has recognized gender inequality as a problem in the last couple of decades. And it's encouraged companies to adopt uh, voluntary targets, so soft targets to increase the share of women in management. And at the broader societal level, I should also say uh, that gender norms have been rapidly shifting in a more egalitarian direction, even though we haven't seen, um, haven't seen this play out in the labor market per se in a large scale. And so this broader context where gender inequality remains high, <clears throat> but addressing barriers to women's careers is to some extent on the agenda, makes also for an analytically useful case for our research. So to the extent that gender inequality remains high, processes that might be more subtle or muted in more egalitarian contexts are likely to be a little bit more clearly apparent, making them easier to identify. And at the same time, gender inequality is not so uncontested that we would expect it to be impervious to factors associated with women in management and work group contexts. Um, and indeed, Food Co. itself um, has, as I mentioned, has a reputation of being a bit of a, you know, woman-friendly company, and its CEO was a founding member of the 30% initiative in Korea. So this is an initiative that started in the UK, and the goal is to promote having, you know, at least 30% of women on corporate boards um, and women executives more generally. So progress hasn't been dramatic, I will say, at Food Co., but there has been some increase of women in managerial ranks, and there's a perception that, you know, that this 30% uh, initiative like matters. It's on, it's, it's in the air, it's on the agenda. And this is um, implemented sort of in the time frame of our study. Um, at the same time, advances for women have not been uncontested and not surprisingly, uh, that 30% initiative has created some resentment and perception of unfairness among men. Uh, so we have a quote here from a man at Foodco, he's a senior manager in business marketing. He says, women don't express themselves, but they're happy. Men are like, we probably won't make it. Uh, if 30% of men candidates were promoted to executives before, now only 10% of men would be promoted. And women would now be like 200% with mass of the law. But you know, you get the, what he's thinking of here. Uh, because statistically, 30% of employees are not in the candidate group. Female employees take this with pleasure, but I'm against it. Rather, such words are words that prevent women from being respected for going to executive. So he's expressing, I, I won't read the rest of it, uh, expressing some concern about this initiative, that it's not fair. And women also express some ambivalence, fearing devaluation and backlash. Uh, so a woman here, she's in research and development, she's in her 40s, she says, our general CEO announced that he would make up to 30% of female executives, which is more annoying for our women. Then if I become an executive, I won't know if I got it because of my ability or because of that 30% initiative. As I told you, women work well, they're good at work and good at managing performance. In terms of per performance, if there's a woman and a man who join the company at the same time, woman is much superior. So if you just let it go at, with the performance, 30% wasn't difficult to achieve. 
For a year after he declared the 30% initiative, male employees continued to talk sarcastically like, oh, you must be the next to be promoted because of the 30%. Whenever I heard that kind of sarcastic reaction, I felt uncomfortable. So these quotes reinforce the salience of gender at Food Co. with respect to perceptions of performance, rewards, and advancement opportunities in the time of our study. And while the context might have heightened managers' awareness of gender equity concerns, it also likely made threats associated with devaluation and perceptions of favoritism particularly salient. All right, so what do we actually do? So we have uh, longitudinal comprehensive personnel data from Food Co. spanning uh, the years uh, we're focusing on here are between 2013 and 2018. And we have uh, you know, quite, quite a large number of observations in this data set over time. We drop out the manual workforce. Uh, so we're focusing on the sort of the white collar uh, workforce here for our analysis. And we also get rid of workers on teams uh, that have less than three people in any given year. Uh, we also, for our wage observations, exclude the team supervisors. So this leaves us with almost 12,000 workers in a little bit over 1,000 work groups for our analysis. Our dependent variable uh, is, uh, is at the individual level. This is annual earnings, uh, and it includes both the regular annual salary and other monetary rewards like bonuses. We also, in some analysis, look at performance pay. Uh, for T This, this um, happens for both teams and individuals, but our our um, way of analyzing focuses on the individual part um, and also just looking at the base salary. We also look at performance evaluations. Those are on a five point score and also just whether people receive the bonus. So our independent variable is a three way interaction between gender, supervisor gender and the gender composition of the work group and work groups I should reiterate are sort of the lowest level of the organizational hierarchy uh, at Foodco and they range from one to 73 members in a given year with a mean of you know, seven and a median of five. So they tend to be you know, quite small intimate groups and they're relatively homogeneous but they can contain a mix of jobs, occupations and grades, job grades. We control for a variety of things, uh, the calendar year, age, tenure and its square, uh, education, uh, employment status, um, job grade, occupation and work group size. Okay, so our estimation stat, uh, strategy run, is basically to run regressions with work group fixed effects. And these are helpful for our purposes because they focus directly on the workers for whom managers can directly impact compensation and for whom the demographics of work groups should matter. And they're also important because they account for potential unobserved factors that might impact both the gender of supervisors and gender equity in compensation. So if women managers tend to be sorted into less powerful, non-growing organizational units, there may be less scope for gender inequality and performance related aspects of pay as there are fewer resources to be allocated. And also I think more importantly, women might be more likely to rise to a position of team leader where work groups are a bit more egalitarian. So this are, we account for that with our, um, with our analysis strategy. And we can do this analysis strategy because there's substantial within team variation in supervisors and gender composition over time. Finally, to the results. <laughs> okay, so uh, before we turn to our model estimates, it's useful to have a sense of the overall gender earnings gap uh, at Food Co. This is large overall, with men earning 31% more than women. When we look within work groups, it shrinks to 20%, telling us that women are sorted into groups that tend to pay women uh, tend to pay workers less. Adding our controls not surprisingly shrinks that gender wage gap. And when we add job controls, it shrinks even further, but it's still even at the detailed job level, men are earning more than women. Now, the next uh, chart here is just to give you a sense that there is in fact considerable variability in the gender wage gap across work groups. And I'm gonna hurry a little bit here because I know we wanna have time for, uh, time for questions as well. This is just the gross uh, gender wage gap on the left and then the gender wage gap on the right uh, across these different work groups. And we see that there is considerable spread across those work groups. Okay, so here's our first uh, here's our first actual analysis. What we're looking at with the graph here um, is uh, the estimate of the percent gender wage gap across work groups that range uh, in the percent of women in them. So on the left, there's uh, fewer women. On the right, there's more women. Um, and how that gender wage gap uh, varies according to whether there is a man supervisor, that's the red line, or a woman supervisor. 
And so we see, and we restrict the view uh, to between 10% and 95% women to have sort of meaningful, meaningful estimates here. So if we look first at the red line, this is the men's supervisors, we see that women are consistently earning less within work groups when they are managed by men. This is, you know, well below the zero line here, um, and that this becomes more pronounced as groups become more female dominated. When groups are more strongly male dominated, more than 35% men and supervised by women, there's no significant gender wage gap within them. Um, and note that the estimates on the far end there are the very male dominated groups are, are imprecise because there's not a lot of women supervisors in those groups. Um, however, as the share of women in them grows, so does the gender wage gap for women groups supervised by women, revealing a stronger effect of gender composition for women managers actually relative to men. So what we're seeing here then is that uh, it is advantageous to have a woman manager, at least at the overall level, but only in those groups that tend to be when they're male dominated. So this is, a, this is the overall picture, not including controls. What happens when we include our controls? Well, the general picture basically remains the same. So the gender gap overall shrinks, but the general pattern is similar. Within work group, gender inequality tends to grow as the gender composition shifts towards women, but it's more pronounced uh, when groups have women managers. Uh, and we still see that advantage in those male dominated groups of having a woman versus a male manager. So no evidence that status threats are blunting women managers' ability to act as agents of change in those male dominated groups. And we also don't see them as reducing gender inequality whenever groups are gender imbalanced, regardless of the direction as identity theory would predict. And so the general picture is consistent with expectations derived from status characteristics theory. So um, I'm, this is this is our main <laughs> this is our main finding. We can do you know a number of other analysis to kind of pull this apart a little bit more and see what's driving the pattern. Um, we can look at performance assessments, for example, to see you know is this because women managers are assessing performance uh, in more favorable ways in those male-dominated groups relative to men. There is a limitation when we look at performance assessments that not all workers are assessed, and this is not uh, this is not at random. Workers lower in the hierarchy are less likely to have a formal performance assessment, so we'll keep that in mind. Um, but when we just look at the the formal performance assessments and whether uh, this mirrors our pattern, we don't actually see this as being the case. And in fact, we don't see a lot of difference here uh, in terms of uh, gender inequality in the performance assessments at all. So with those formalized uh, ways of looking at things. So it might not just be the, uh, the assessment, but rather the consequences of the assessment. This is something that Castilla finds in his research that there's a performance bias where uh, women get lower bonuses for the same performance scores than men. So we look at this as well. And we do see a little bit of a pattern here in terms of your likelihood of receiving a um, of receiving a bonus, uh, controlling for us, uh, controlling for performance here, and uh, we do see that a similar pattern of women's likelihood of getting a bonus going down as groups become more male, uh, more male dominated, and again, more of an advantage in those male dominated groups in terms of having a woman supervisor. Um, the biggest, the the biggest picture where we see it most clearly though is when we just look at the base salary, and this is just looking taking the bonuses out of the, out of the picture, and we see that this largely replicates our, our finding when we just look at the base salary. Finally, in this, uh, in this last picture here, we control for um, the actual individual job attributes, which we hadn't included as a control before. Um, so we're looking, we're now down at the very detailed level. Uh, and we remember that not everyone in a work group is in the same job, although they, they often are. Um, and we see a couple of things. So first of all, even controlling for even controlling for job, there's still that gender earnings gap when groups are supervised by men and for female dominated groups with women supervisors. So it's considerably smaller, telling us, of course, that the allocation of men and women to different jobs within work groups contributes to unequal earnings. And we do still see the general pattern of earnings becoming more unequal as groups become more female dominated. So while diminished, having a woman manager is also still associated with a somewhat smaller gender wage gap in moderately male dominated groups. And so what we see from this is that most of the advantage of having a, of having a woman supervisor in these groups is tied to women managers allocating men and women to jobs in a more egalitarian manner. But there's also some residual benefit beyond this. Now, the last thing that we, uh, that we look at here, and I'll be very quick, um, is 
sort of this idea of position in the hierarchy and formalization, because remember, we saw this as being something that past research had shown that mattered. And at Foucault, we have this really clear categorical distinction between workers in the general track and what is called the field track. And the workers in the field track, they actually aren't even assigned a job grade because they don't have the possibility of moving up the job ladder. They're kind of on a set in, in a separate category and they're much less likely to have their performance assessed. So they really map onto this category being low in the organizational uh, hierarchy and also being subject to less formal oversight uh, and formalization in how they are assessed and rewarded. And what we find is that when we look at workers outside of this field track, and I will say that most is about half of men and 75% of women are on that field track where they're outside the sort of the career ladders, we don't really see this picture. So we do, we see a lot less gender inequality overall, and we don't see the clear, the clear pattern by supervisor gender. Where we see it is in that field track where there's less formalization and where they're lower in the, in the categories, uh, in the hierarchy. So just to sum up, Having a woman supervisor does matter for the gender wage gap, but that relationship is really conditioned by the gender composition of the wage group. And the effect is concentrated where employment relations are less formalized for those outside the internal labor market, which reinforces those findings from Germany and the US and extending them by showing that work group composition also matters and conditions this. We also see that supervisor gender matters more for sticky floors, <laughs> women at the bottom, than for breaking through the glass ceiling per se, despite the fact that a lot of the, you know, a lot of the sort of the policy talk and a lot of the research around this has been motivated by this idea of like helping women, you know, reach the top. We're really showing that it actually matters at the bottom more. Um, and it's really for those field track workers where having a female supervisor matters when those groups are more male dominated. And just to put this in context, where are where are women most likely to have the conditions where having a woman supervisor makes a difference? Well, <laughs> there, th those are the conditions where you're less likely to see uh, to see women in those groups, right? Having women in male dominated, uh, having women supervisors, uh, the likelihood increases as groups become more female, become more female dominated, which may help account for the reason that we see those null effects overall. So just as a last slide here, uh, some of the implications are that uh, we, we shouldn't just think of organizations as homogeneous uh, and sort of comparing across organizations, but within organizational variation matters, and that providing those opportunities for women to attain authority positions isn't necessarily enough. That gender integration at the work group, matter, work group level matters as well. And the circumstances where women are most likely to promote egalitarian outcomes for their workers are the least common. So sorting employees to workers by gender and then placing women supervisors to supervise women subordinates in highly women-dominated work group settings, which is the most common outcome, low in the organizational hierarchy, tends to mute the potential for women managers to act as agents of change. And that's it, thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Sylvia. That was really, really fascinating. Um, a lot of really interesting and complex data there presented very clearly. Um, so that's great. You did very well with keeping to time. So I was so going so fast. <laughs> <laughs> I was drink. I was. I was saying I was drinking my coffee as we went to, you know, yeah. increase the pace and get more <laughs> caffeinated as we went along. It was great. So the good news is that we have um, a, a good amount of time for a Q and A. So what I'd like to do is just open up the floor and see if anyone has questions. As a reminder, you can unmute yourself um, or put a question in the chat, and that's great. I see Sean has a question, so I'll pass it on to him. Sylvia, that was a great talk. Very interesting. I'm just, I, I didn't see parenthood as a control. Um, do you have a control for parenthood? Um, we know that women experience motherhood penalties. Father, fathers have a fatherhood bonus. Um, could maybe you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, unfortunately, we don't. The food code does not collect that, uh, does not collect that information. They collect information on marital status, uh, which is quite sort of in the Korean context is quite tied because you still see, we, we don't see this so much in Canada anymore, but in Korea, you still have that kind of M-shaped pattern of women's labor market participation, where once women get married, uh, and especially when they have kids, but often even just at marriage, they're more likely to withdraw from the labor market for a, a period of time. Um, and we see this, I didn't actually uh, read the whole quote, but I'm just going back to uh, the sort of that male manager talking about, uh, talking about the situation with the 30% initiative. And one of the things he says here is, um, so after he says, you know, 
uh, you know, even, even though women become executives, they do not recognize that they're not being respected for their ability. And then he says, saying that we're gonna put people who aren't even capable in the executive pool and go to 30% in a few years. So all you have to do is hold out, even if you give birth, <laughs> regardless of the evaluation. And we sort of, there's this sort of thing going on there that you might miss if you're not attuned to that of like, this sort of generalized expectation, well, you know, if you give birth, of course you shouldn't be, you know, considered for, um, uh, for, for promotion. So we can't look at that. And I, I sort of went back, waffle back and forth about whether we should control for marital status. We didn't, because I think that it's so entwined with gender assumptions and stereotypes and ideas about who should or should not be granted opportunities. That if you control for that, you're sort of over controlling, right? You're sort of missing one of those really key mechanisms that are disadvantaging women. Um, even in a place like Foucault, which by South Korean standards, is really progressive on this measure. Like they have, you know, policies to promote women coming back in, providing more flexible work opportunities than is typical in the South Korean context. Um, so, and you know, and 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 there are lots of mothers working at 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 Food Co. Um, so, so that's the somewhat long answer <laughs> to the question: is that a we don't have the we don't have the data, and b even if we did, I think for this analysis, I probably wouldn't. You know, you, you might want to delve in, into it more, but then you're dealing with four-way interactions, which is just crazy pants, right? Like at a certain point, you, you just start to, <laughs> starts to, your head starts to explode, right? Interpreting those. So um, I probably wouldn't control for it in this particular case, even if I did. But thanks for the question. It's, yeah, it's a great one. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Sean. Uh, okay, Anna is next. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Sylvia. This was super interesting. And I have to admit, I'm a sucker for the quotes. They're, I mean, you, you could build 40 minute talk just based on those because they're so interesting. Um, if I can follow up on, on indirectly on what, she, what Sean just asked, uh, I have a question that's very non-original, but one that I've been curious about. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a very different context with very different as you just mentioned, gender uh, uh, beliefs, identity, stereotypes, prejudices, et cetera. Do you have any sort of intuition or or even data uh, um, how your findings would look like or may apply to uh, either Canadian or the U.S. context? Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I and I think you you raise a really important point, right? So when we think about the sort of the specifics of of gender stereotypes. Those are not those are not universal, and in fact, my co-author Young Mi Kim is working on a paper right now where she's sort of looking at those gender stereotypes using this food code, using this food code data, and sort of arguing that some of the you know some of the assumptions about like what stereotypes are are happening are are quite different in the South Korean context, right? But that they still end up you know operating in the same way to the extent that whatever those gender stereotypes are. And in this case, actually, there tends to be more of a valuation of like men as communal, <laughs> as communal beings, right? As the sort of like, they're the company men, they're the ones who are loyal, they're the ones who are like going out for drinks after, you know, after dinner and, and all that stuff, right? So some of those stereotypes that we might think of being as more feminine in our context of women as being more communal, there is sort of like the men being more communal, but it's still whatever's associated with men is what's valued. <laughs> Right, and it's what's you know what's uh, what counts in that context, right? So I I I think that that's you know it's it's ultimately an empirical question, but I do think that the fact that our findings are are really quite consistent in terms of like the formalization and being lower on the hierarchy with like the only two other studies that have really looked at this with that kind of data and that are in Germany and in the U.S suggest to me that, um, you know, we might be onto something that's a little bit broader. And certainly the, you know, the theoretical underpinnings that we're drawing on, you know, we're not generating theory from scratch here. Um, those, those have been, those have actually been largely developed in the North American context, right? So I, you know, any kind of case study research obviously tells you most about the particular case and then the generaliz generalizability is an open, you know, is an open question. But those kinds of dynamics where you might expect to see, you know, women managers being more attuned to gender inequity in the male dominated groups and therefore maybe thinking more carefully about how they're assigning men and women to different jobs in those groups. Um, I, I, my intuition is I think that that's, I think that that's more general because I think that that's where 
that's where those issues are become more salient, right? And most likely to, you know, impact women managers in terms of having them be at the top of the mind. Um, and also that, you know, the idea of having less formalized context, making more space for people to make those kinds of differentiation, that is, you know, that is also very sort of, that's, that's very consistent with what we see in the in the broader literature, you know, and even though we, we see more inequality overall in those less formalized settings, which is also consistent with what we see. But thank you. That's a really great question. Hey, okay, that's great. So uh, some flurry of hands have gone up. So what I think I'm going to do is because I don't know if some of these comments maybe respond directly to what Sylvia is saying. So Yoko, Howard and Kim, if I can invite you each to maybe ask your question. And then um, we'll let Sylvia respond. So Yoko, you can go first. You know, I went really fast. So if anyone needs me to just like slow down and go back and clarify any points, I'm also happy to do that. Okay. Thank you, Sylvia. It was really fascinating talk and it's very, very interesting. And uh, uh, I know that there is uh, you know, uh, differences between Japan and Korea and Japan, Japan is a place that I came from, but then I, I could see a little bit of like similarity in terms of historical, uh, uh, context in terms of gender inequality and, and I could see that you know, there's you know, similarity in terms of the, uh, the gender inequality in terms of managerial position in Japan and Korea. But that being said, you know, from that uh, experience uh, and my observation over like you know, East Asian context, you know, part of the authority, authoritative figure uh, is like it's related with the gender but at the same time, I think that there is a strong uh, impact in terms of age or the experience in the specific the corporate context. So I was kind of wondering, I know that you control for age in your equation, but I was wondering if you kind of like looked at or hashed out the age in terms of the age of the, the managers and the age of the workers uh, in that unit. And then if some kind of like there's kind you know some any interesting insight or the you know significance in terms of you know gender like women uh, manager who are a lot older than the young like male workers as compared to you know young uh, you know uh, out of like NBA like managers you know coming into the male dominated workplace I was kind of wondering if you could tease out a little bit about the age differences interacted with gender. That's, that's such a great, uh, that's such a great suggestion. Um, again, it makes me start to go into four-way interactions, which makes me nervous, but I could, you know, maybe I could separate them out. And, and as you, as, as you say that it is really historically an important component, you know, in those career systems in the organizations. Now, I will say that uh, one of the things uh, that's happened at Food Co prior to, uh, um, prior to the time period we looked at was that there was a total overhaul and reorganization of their, um, of their promotion and hierarchical system. Prior to 2008, it was very much an age-based system. So seniority at, uh, seniority in, in, and which was tied to age as well because of not a lot of moving in and out of the corporation um, was the biggest predictor of wages <laughs> at Food Co. And there was the percent, so it was very much like, like you described that, that you know, this was how the, how the organization was organized, right? This was the reward structure. Um, that was all reorganized in 2008 with the idea that, you know, this was backward, this wasn't, you know, this, we need to focus on performance, uh, we, we, sh we shouldn't be doing this anymore. And so they moved towards a sort of a job grade system. The number of job grades proliferated, now we're like 500 some job grades, we have these, you know, clear, clear hierarchies and performance is now um, you know, age is still correlated with rewards, but much less strongly than before. Now the job grade is the biggest correlator with, with rewards. So I think that it also provides an interesting context probably that might be better explored with qualitative research of where you, see, where you see that shift in the reward structure, right? You see that shift in what is being valued in the organization that has implications, right? It obviously has implications for older men. <laughs> you know, it has implications for younger workers. It maps to gender, right? Because of that M-shaped, you know, pattern where women are more likely to come out of the organization and then, you know, maybe rejoin later. And so they have that discontinuity, which under that seniority-based system was absolutely devastating, right, for their, for their outcomes. 
Yet, um, yet we don't actually see as much dramatic gender difference <laughs> pre and post as one might expect, right? And moving away from that seniority-based system given women's pattern of labor market participation, which shows you still that some of the assumptions underlying it are based on, you know, still, still reflect the, the existing hierarchies, you know, at that time that have a new, you know, a, a new life in a, in a more formalized, slightly different way. So that's a, that's a bit of a long and a rambling answer, but I, I do think that there are probably some really interesting dynamics that are going on there. Um, and I think that probably qualitative research is what you need, honestly, to really, to really get at, to get out what's, what's going on. I mean, we, we could, we could try and look at age and maybe run them, but I feel like to really dig into that, you would, you would want to be interviewing and observing people. But thank you for the suggestion. Thanks, Yoko. Okay, so I had Howard and Kim, did you still want to ask your question or was it answered? Oh, sorry. Okay. I really enjoyed your talk, Sil Sylvia. It's nice to meet Hi, you. Kim. <laughs> Um, I was just thinking, well, I was thinking about the, the managers and what you had at sort of level two, right? Like mm -hmm. what we knew about the, 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 you know, the age, the tenure of the managers, perhaps like the, you know, female women managers are newer to the organization, they're younger. And I, I just was thinking on that level, like the level two managerial level and what you could say or bring in about that. So it, it was related for sure. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, it's, it, it is super important. And here is where we actually have a bit of a limitation in our data too. So we have in our data set, uh, direct information from the, uh, from the company as for each individual as to whether or not they have a woman manager. The, the gender of their manager. So that, that information has been provided. But for confidentiality reasons, uh, Foucault did not want to give us the information to directly link the individual to their supervisor. <laughs> so we, um, we sort of make assumptions about uh, who is in fact the team leader in that work group because the, the, the system is basically within a given team, you have the team leader who is classified as part of the work group and who evaluates everybody in the team. And then that person is evaluated by someone higher in the, in the hierarchy. We, that, that person we can't link because <laughs> we, we don't know who they are. Within the team, we can make assumptions and we, you know, we do make assumptions and sort of pulling out the team leaders so we don't include them in the wage equations about who has the highest job grade combined with the highest earnings um, and that this person is likely to, be, <laughs> likely to be the team leader. But there's a possibility of some, of some error there. So... It, it makes us a little bit more cautious about sort of really going down the road of looking in detail at the characteristics of, of the supervisor, because while, you know, we feel pretty confident that we've pulled out the right person, um, we're not a hundred percent, we're not a hundred percent sure. Um, so I do think that, I do think that all those things can, you know, can certainly make a difference. And really, if we think about it conceptually, you know, the, all of those sort of like micro power dynamics, how long has the person been the supervisor, right? You know, have they, have, are they just new in this position? I have, they been there for a long, you know, for a long time. Um, are they coming in sort of from outside with their, you know, with their MBA versus rising up through the ranks? Like all of those things I think can really, um, can make a difference in terms of how empowered that what that supervisor might be to sort of act on their discretion and to maybe feel like they can champion you know particular subordinates or to which extent they might you know identify with the sort of the power structure versus you know versus women subordinates all those things I think are really quite relevant um, and definitely worth worth investigating in future research although maybe not with this data set okay thanks um, maybe I'll take Rachel and then Howard, if there's time, yeah, we'll come back to you. Oh, Howard, you can go. It's cool. Okay. I'll just ask a quick thing, which, uh, is a bit of a different strand of, or of thought, but related, which I'm, I'm quite fascinated with the, the notion of what does it mean to create interventions for sticky floors versus glass ceilings? And you didn't have a ton of time to expand on that. Uh, and, and I'm really curious about, you know, what would those interventions be and what are the blockage points? And, and I sort of think, is it that the, 
you know, the top end of the firm has training and has bought into the organizational shift and organizational mission, but it hasn't translated down, or is it a matter of the, the, the floor being just a very different structure? And, and so I was wondering if you had thought a little bit about that kind of end of things yet or not. Yeah, and I do think that this is, I think that just generally, this is something that we need to pay more attention to in scholarship on gender inequality at work. I think that, you know, we've, we sort of in, in some, it's happening, right? But to some extent, there's been a bit of a disjuncture between work that has sort of focused on, you know, women in organizations and inequality in organizations that has really focused on that glass ceiling, right? And sort of like having women move through the ranks, partly because a lot of that work has been done, sort of done through business schools, I would say, and organized scholars in business schools and instead of sort of looking in the organizational stuff. Um, and then you have the work on sort of precarious employment that has um, <coughs> certainly sometimes had a gender gender component, but not so much looking in sort of looking at the organizational level, I would say. So I think that there's that there is a bit of a disjuncture there. Um, and I and I do, and I think there's a lot of things that are that are going on that we're really just starting to, you know, starting to think through. So certainly, and again, I mean, this isn't a this isn't a strong causal analysis, right? So we have to be really careful about, you know, making making really bold claims about what should be done based on sort of you know observational research like this. Um, but I do think it does suggest that we sort of need to need to look at those processes at the bottom of organizations more carefully in terms of what are those power dynamics uh, in those, you know, in those groups and how do they create contexts where, you know, workers may be more or less empowered to sort of, you know, make claims <laughs> and supervisors may be more or less empowered to, um, to grant them or, you know, or not. And here is, I think, where you see the double-edged sword of the formalization, right? So formalization, what we're seeing, you know, elsewhere in the hierarchy where we have these more formalized employment relations, um, we see less sort of like within work group gender inequality. And so, and we're not seeing the difference in the performance assessments, for example, right? So to some extent, those, those initiatives are working at that level of curbing sort of obvious discrimination, like within, you know, within jobs, obvious favoritism. Lower in the organizational hierarchy, there's, there's sen there, things are, I would say, less scrutinized and sort of there's less attention, probably because there's less consideration of that group of workers as even being eligible for moving up the ladder. So if you're not concerned about them moving up the ladder, and if you're looking at like relatively small differences, probably because you're looking at lower wage workers, you know, in rewards, it may not seem like it's very important, right, as being an area where you would pay attention and where you would really want to foster gender equity per se, right? And it may be that actually, you know, pragmatically, improving the conditions at the bottom for everybody will have a bigger impact on the well-being and lives of those women workers than, you know, gender, you know, gender, gender equity anyway, right? I and mean, when you think about what, what matters there, and we see at Foucault, like more, more people moving into those less formalized job categories over time. I mean, that's a big, that's a big problem. But I do think that, um, you know, paying attention to those relational dynamics, perhaps where there's less scrutiny, um, does, you know, this research does suggest that that that, that is important. Um, and I would say that it also probably suggests that maybe we, we also need to be thinking about the extent to which these, you know, two tier labor markets within organizations are being created. And so that when we think about gender equity, we don't just think about the people in the more privileged ranks, that we also think about how do we you know, how do we pay attention <laughs> to the sticky floors and also how do we make them less sticky so mm -hmm. that some of the benefits that come along with, you know, the possibility for career advancement also uh, flow down to people at the, at the bottom. I'm sorry, I know that that's not, you know, that's sort of like not a silver bullet answer, but I, I think it is, I think it is tricky and I think it does speak to the extent to which people in these kinds of employment relations tend to be, tend not to be treated as organizational insiders in the first place, right? And so, they're not, um, they're not granted the same sort of concern and consideration and thinking about, you know, their well-being and their, and their equality in the organization. Thanks, Sylvia. Okay, so Rachel, I'll pass it back to you. So Sylvia, the context for this study is so interesting. I mean, a country with such high gender inequality and 
like a company within that country that's more progressive. It's, it's fascinating. Um, one thing that really stood out is that you said that you didn't promise uh, when you got the data that you were going to keep the identity secret. So I'm curious, and I feel like our students would also be super curious about how you ended up with these data and sort of how that condition came to pass. Um, because like, this is a really great example of like a kind of data set that perhaps like, you know, a student would be interested in for a dissertation, like some sort of, yeah. So if you could speak a little bit about that, I think, uh, we would all find it really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I did not get access to the data. My co-author, Young Me Kim, got access to the data, I will say, okay. uh, which, you know, is probably not surprising. She's based, she's Korean. She's based in Korea at Yonsei University. And she's sort of, you know, one of the sort of top scholars looking at gender at work um, in the Korean context. So she, um, she connected with the CEO through this sort of 30% initiative because she has, you know, advised government and been sort of a recognized expert in this area. And they were actually interested in having her come and study the organization because they, they, you know, had, had this commitment to the 30% initiative and wanted to, uh, wanted to better understand how they could promote gender equity in the organization. So this was, um, so, so this was sort of fortuitous and it did have to do with the organization's commitment to, you know, and, and really the CEO's commitment <laughs> uh, to, to promoting gender equity in the, in the organization. So that is how uh, Young Me came to have access to the data. And she has also, uh, you know, as you see from the couple of interview quotes, you know, also gone in and interviewed sort of middle managers in the organization um, and so forth to try and understand what's, um, What's, what's going on there. So it's through Young Me, uh, and I got connected through Young Me because she came to, sabbat to have sabbatical at UBC, and we had lots of interests in common, and most importantly, we just really liked each other and hit it off, which is the most important thing when you're collaborating with someone on projects that always take longer than, uh, than, than you think that they will. So yeah. it's been a lot of, uh, it's been a lot of fun working with her. Oh, that's so great. And so when you publish, are you going to say what company it is? You know, it's funny because I I, we, I was talking with Young Me about it. So she's you know she's been calling it Food Co and writing and writing about it as Food Co. And certainly, organizational scholars often like they they do identify the companies when they're doing when they're doing case studies. Um, so I I'm not sure. I'll have to have more conversations with her about it. I don't I don't think we make the organization look bad, you no. know. Um, and it is I'm not sure whether the context would be. I mean, I was googling to learn more about the company. I'm like, oh, and they're in the U.S. and oh, all these brands. I'm like, oh, this branded tofu is from you know this company. It's sort of I, I think that sometimes like readers like that, right? To have yeah. like a little bit more of the context. So I might push towards identifying to you know to sort of have have a little more sort of like detail and context there but yeah she she, she wasn't asked to to anonymize and she didn't promise to anonymize very cool that's really interesting okay well um i think that brings us right to 12 o'clock so well done everyone for keeping us bang on time so if everyone can just join me in thanking dr fuller again for such a fascinating talk and i think lots of us will be following your research and seeing where you publish and see what kind of insights maybe you even provide back to food code would be interesting before i let you all go if i can just remind everyone um, that next friday we have dr uh, Wu Jingwu, who she's here uh, today attending to. She's delivering our first brown bag session. So that's the 3rd of December from 11 to 12. And her talk is titled, Have Someone to Help, Families and the Unmet Need for Help in Later Life. And then just a reminder, we don't have another uh, colloquium series uh, in December, aside from Wu Jing. Um, but the next one's the 13th of January, where we have Danielle Belanger, uh, and this is a joint session with Mer. So Sylvia, thank you again so much. So fascinating. You're very bright and alert for so early in the morning. <laughs> see. Uh, so thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And thank you for all the wonderful questions. It's, um, it was really great. And they'll certainly be helping us as we uh, move this paper, move this paper along. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.